Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start, can I ask if everybody kind of steps in a little bit? Um, cool. This is an amazing turnout. Thank you all so much for coming here to Noma. Um, we're really delighted to have this opportunity to hear from the artist Lena Iris Victor on the first day um, of her exhibition, which is new in the Great Hall, um, called A Haven, A Hell, A Dream Deferred. Uh, my name is Allison Young. I'm a curatorial fellow for contemporary art here at NOMA, um, and I'm really delighted to have been working on this exhibition alongside Lena. Um, so we're just so thrilled to have it here and to kind of finally see it come to fruition in this beautiful space. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce the artist and let her take it from here. Um, so Lena Iris Victor is a conceptual artist, performance artist, and painter who lives and works between New York and London. In her work, she weaves disparate materials and methods belonging to both contemporary and ancient art forms in order to call into question the nature of time and being. Her works merge photography, performance, and abstract painting with the ancient practice of gilding with 24 karat gold. And each piece, which she refers to as light works, provokes a philosophical commentary through material that at once addresses the infinite and the finite, immor immortality and mortality, the microcosm and macrocosm, in addition to the socio-political and historical preconceptions surrounding blackness and its universal implications. Victor's multidisciplinary practice is informed by a background in film, which she studied at Sarah Lawrence College, and her continued studies with photography and design at the School of Visual Arts, along with an education in performance arts during high school. Um, and all of these different backgrounds and experiences come to bear in these really beautiful works that I see around us. Um, so Victor has exhibited at Harvard Art Museums and the Cooper Gallery at Harvard University, the Kentucky Museum of Arts and Craft, and Spelman Museum of Fine Art at Spelman College. She's also engaged in critical talks, panels, and lectures at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, Harvard University, New York University, and the Institute of Contemporary Arts London, um, in addition to King's College London, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the St. Louis Art Museum, as well as Autograph ABP um, in London. Um, and we're really pleased to add the New Orleans Museum of Art to this list um, and to introduce her on the um, opening day of her solo museum presentation here. So without further ado, um, I'm thrilled to introduce Lena Iris Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, thank you all for taking the time to attend uh, this opening and uh, this talk this afternoon. Um, I wanted to keep this very informal because really what I enjoy the most is speaking to other people and kind of getting, hearing people's questions and um, getting feedback in that way about what people are seeing in the work. Um, but essentially, uh, this body of work is a site-specific body of work that was created specifically for New Orleans Museum. Um, when Allison came Alec wrote me and asked if I were interested in doing a show at this museum. Of course, the answer is uh, yes, because it's such a beautiful architectural gem and a historic site within the city. Um, and visiting here the first time last year during Prospect, and, and then again doing more research in March, I've really fallen in love with New Orleans. Um, I started a body of work on paper, which is not my usual medium, especially at this scale. Uh, probably around January 2017 um, that was kind of exploring the ideas uh, that I found interesting from a more kind of objective level about um, kind of the hidden histories in America and hidden histories pertaining mostly obviously to those of African American descent or African of those of the African diaspora. Uh, I feel like there are some stories that have not been so um, excavated or uh, explored in American history and uh, it's important to discuss these stories, not because I ever like to rehash history to be, you know, um, retroactive, but because we learn from our history to how, to how we pave a way forward. And that is how human beings learn um, about how to, you know, envision a future. So with these works, I was looking at Liberia specifically. I'm Liberian, my parents are both Liberian, but that was not the reason why I was looking at the story. I was looking at the story because um, I think it's more has more universal implications, and I wanted to uh, kind of explore on my end why it would be such a quelled story, um, why in American history it's so important for African American history, 
the founding of Liberia, yet it is such an underdocumented story. So I began there and I was making these works already. Um, and then I, you know, when I, was, when I was given the opportunity to do an exhibition here, uh, I wanted to give it some more specificity to the South and to New Orleans, um, see if there was any kind of cross-referencing of this migration to Liberia um, before that basically happened with, with New Orleans being a big proponent in it, and initially we all came to the conclusion that there wasn't any real um, cross-pollination, which I, I implicitly knew was probably incorrect, but it would require further research, further due diligence. And um, so what I discovered was, when I came here, I think on my second trip, was I discovered um, a, a certain New Orleanian um, character, I'm sure many people here know, called, his name is John McDonough. John McDonough is a, was a philanthropist, a former slave owner, kind of a, a conflicting character because he actually was considered to be kind of a more kind of beneficia beneficiary to his slaves in many ways. Uh, he allowed his slaves to buy their freedom. So by that, I mean that they could work 15 years off, off hours, basically, over 15 years to buy their freedom. And part of the agreement of them buying their freedom back was that they would then be moved to ship to this new colony that was being created in West Africa, Liberia. Liberia was founded by the American Colonization Society. Uh, pretty much further up north was where most of the members were, but there were some like John McDonough in the south. And interesting migration, interesting story because it is a realized migration. The story that most African Americans are very aware of in terms of a, a migration or back to Africa movement is that of uh, Marcus Garvey and Pan-Africanist movement. And it's an idealized um, migration, never happened. So that, that is at the forefront of people's minds, even though it was an unrealized migration. And this other migration happened a century before, a realized migration of at least 13,000 African-American people, kind of is perplexing. Um, so that's what I wanted to discover with these works. And I also wanted to, like I said, give a specificity to John McDonough. Uh, so I, I and Allison did a lot of research. We went to the, the historic society here, we went to Tulane. I was holding primary documents of, of John McDonough's former slave owners writing back to John McDonough, who had already emigrated to Monrovia, which is the capital of Liberia, to this day. Um, and it was just very fascinating, basically, to see these uh, young black men writing back affectionately to their former slave owner, uh, telling them of their initial adventures in Liberia. Um, so really these works, the way I kind of wanted to kind of tell this narrative was through using primary documents, which are throughout the works. So you look at maps and the works that are all primary documents from books from the early 19th, early 20th century um, that were basically like in the work over there, the map that's transcribed on underneath or, or overlaid across the entire canvas is a map of the tribal divisions in the whole Western Af the Western coast of Africa. So where you would see the, the tribes of Bai and Mende and those areas of where, where, where Monrovia and Liberia actually was set, was created and settled in. But that's the whole West, that's the whole of West Africa. And there are other maps as well in the, in the works um, that kind of chart and show the routes of you know, exploration that the members of the ACS did basically to kind of forge and find where would be the right place for this you know, new community to settle. So there are a lot of primary documents. Uh, there's a lot of references and when the book that's coming out is published, it will be much more clear. There are a lot of references to some of the, the very few kind of tomes that I found that were documenting this first migration, what was happening with the first settlers um, from an architectural standpoint, from an agricultural standpoint, uh, how they were basically developing this nation. And uh, so a lot of the imagery is harkens to that that's within those texts as well. Um, I used the figure of the Libyan Sibyl. The Libyan Sibyl is a classical um, prophetess or from Greek mythology basically, and her I guess blessing or her curse was that she was the harbinger almost or the, the seer of ill-fated futures. So her whole role in life was to basically tell people in present day what's gonna happen in the future. In a weird twist of 
Um, I guess I find it very ironic, but in a weird twist of fate, during the abolition of slavery in the South, a lot of the abolitionist writers, artists, and the like exhumed this prophetess character, the Libyan Sybil, to kind of speak to the, the, the ill-fated kind of future that was going to befall the African peoples across you know, the continent and how they got kind of spread around the diaspora. So it was interesting because it's kind of retroactive. She tells the future, but they're using her retroactively. Um, but I thought it was interesting regardless that you had this kind of conduit or this kind of character that, that these abolitionists were using to filter these stories of why slavery was now wrong 300 years in. Um, to kind of bring about the speed of, of the end of slavery, basically. So the Libyan, the Libyan Sybil also was likened to Sojourner Truth. Um, and if you go to the Mets or you go to the High Museum of Art, you'll see the giant kind of sculptures of the Libyan Sybil. I mean, it's a very kind of known character in American lore and American history. And, uh, and so I use that as this kind of conduit which, uh, to tell the story as in she's pointing things out and showing certain kind of truths that are hidden within the works. Uh, and, and they're all photo-based works that are then painted and gilded around. Um, that's pretty much what the, the kind of basis of the, the actual uh, narrative of the work was about. And within the works there are, like I said, many references to many different kind of aspects that are true to West African cultures and also those that are localized to Liberia itself. Um, and, and then in terms of my practice in general, this was a very kind of, it was a, it was a, it was a jump for me. It was a, uh, an experiment as I think all work should be with artists, uh, whether it's showing in a museum or never leaves your studio, it's always about experimenting and pushing kind of the, your comfort zone in terms of what you're comfortable in doing and the vision that you're trying to kind of emanate. And anyone that's known my work up until now knows that my palette has been very, very reduced. Um, and for many, many reasons, mostly because of the ability to explore endlessly when you have restrictions. And I, I explore endlessly the kind of value of blackness through my work and the, the meaning on a metaphysical level, on a um, kind of humanist level, our relationship with gold, storied, our storied relationship with gold from you know, the beginning of time to now, how we have changed, our narratives around gold have changed, um, our way of, of positioning gold in the, I guess, the hierarchy of import, the spiritual import, the financial import in our lives, how that has changed over time across civilizations. Uh, so gold to me is a, is a very kind of mythical, magical material unlike any other on earth. And that is why I use it with the abundance that I do with the explicit intent to reinvoke the idea, the spiritual quotient that exists in gold that I think we have forgotten, that we have lost. So with these works, what the jump was, was that I went back to color, full color. Um, and that was, it was hard to do, to be honest. I find it very, um, it, was, it was a risky thing as an artist to kind of make that kind of jump in this kind of stage. And, um, and so a lot of the works you'll see have the red in them. <coughs> the red was a, you know, it was an exploration of the iconography that was used that becomes simpatico with Liberia and the US. What most people don't necessarily know about Liberia is as it was founded, it was founded in the image, and I mean in the absolute image of America. So it was basically a little America in West Africa. And all the iconography, all the memorabilia, all of the naming of the cities and the states and the capital, um, the currency, the coinage, the stamps, all of that was made in the image of American kind of um, visual schematics. So it looks American. And Liberia to this day has a lot of iconography that still looks very American, which doesn't really make sense if you don't know the history. So the color scheme was really about trying to bring about this, this uh, simpatico, this symbiosis, this idea of, of a sister state that's across the water um, with a very different story from the rest of the African continent and the kind of colonial kind of histories of the rest of the African continent. Afri Africa's first republic. Um, and the work is not really trying to dig into or, or further excavate 
um, what's happening contemporarily in Liberia, because I'm not, that's a whole other conversation that's way too much to dig into, but there is that foreboding, that is that, there is that question, because we do know what happened, and we do know where Liberia is today. So it's about the idea of when you start a country with a certain kind of foundation and a premise, it's very, and now you can see the kind of the, 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 um, the fallout of, because there was a lack of kind of, um, you know, vigilance about what would be the fallout, which I think was pretty, pretty uh, fundamentally, we knew it was gonna happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it does have a foreboding and a bearing on where Liberia is contemporarily, but this work is not about that. This work is about the historical significance and that kind of conversation between the US and Liberia and how, how much of a hand America had in the founding of this West African nation. And uh, the last thing I'd probably talk about is um, the, you know, the compositions of the works and the way the blues are used, the way that the references I'm making in the works, uh, you'll see there are a lot of references to, to West African studio portraiture, uh, Malik Sidibe, Saidu Kita, Mama Cassette. Uh, these are all you know, major figures in the, in, the photo in the photographic world, in the West African photographic space. Um, and what they did with their work, which I found fascinating, especially given the time frames that they were working in or after, uh, where the majority of images that were kind of proliferating outside of the continent were those that were uh, part of a colonial project to further depress the way the imaging and the way people were viewing Africans elsewhere in the world. So after that, you have these you know, titans of photography that are coming in and basically creating these stylized images in their studios that were supposed to ennoble, embolden, uplift, create a whole nother you know, um, vantage point that was very real for their own society, their own life, but create a whole nother vantage point and uh, reverence for their sitter, which wasn't what you would see mostly. So that ennobling, that, that respect, um, you know, that these sitters were afforded basically changed the face of how international communities started to see Africans in the world. And so that is why I, was re I reference those. I also reference a lot of um, imagery from, you know, uh, different eras as well. I'm, I'm directly referencing a lot of the figurations that are seen of the Libyan Sibyl, whether in text or in sculpture. Um, a lot of the formations are actually direct references to the positionality of the Libyan Sibyl um, historically. And, and um, yeah, and then I was also pulling from textiles and hairstyles that are not necessarily just localized to Liberia, but like I said about the region and, um, and trying to kind of employ this cross-referencing, this cross-referencing because the way Africa has been divided up was not our doing. It's been divided up in a way that was for political reasons. And so the way it's carved up is not necessarily the borders that exist culturally. And that also is a conversation about Liberia being a kind of like, you know, a, a localized area in West Africa, neighboring, you know, Nigeria, neighboring Ivory Coast, um, and that there was a lot of cross-pollination with this whole region, not just, it, it's not just about the actual lo locality of Liberia itself and the cultural significance of that. So the works are exploring a lot of things, like the works I do always are exploring a lot of things, and the more you dig, the more you'll find. Um, my expectation is when, people see the work like yourselves and in the future is, and my, my desire is that it's a jump off point because I believe that audiences should work as hard as artists work. So in that regard, if you see something that you're, you find kind of um, incongruous or doesn't make sense, it is on the onus of the person viewing it if they care enough beyond the aesthetic value of the work to dig deeper and figure out more things about what's being said in the work. Uh, what the artist is trying to, to, to you know, point out and histories maybe of stories that are lesser known you know, societally in this space or elsewhere and see and learn about our own histories basically, the global histories, not just uh, European histories, not just African histories, but the global histories. And um, so that was the intent of this exhibition and uh, I hope I didn't go on too long, talk too long. 
And I really want to open up the floor to people who have questions um, because, like I said, that's my favorite part of doing this. Yes? I want to say that this is uh, one of the most extraordinary shows I've ever seen. And your talk is amazing. Thank you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the eroticism and the voyeurism that are in, in some of the images? Interesting. Um, so the voyeurism is true, but I. I in the same way that I think these, like I was talking about, these West African studio portraitures and how these sitters kind of um, own and claim a space, and it's, it's no longer that them being a victim of a person shooting a camera at them, and them that kind of being caught unawares by it, is like they have positioned themselves. So they are in this position of power and autonomy and authorship, as well as the photographer. And so that is also the intent of all the ways that the figure is kind of positioned, looking at you, not looking at you. There is, it is steeped in that sense of, of ownership of self. Um, so I don't, I personally, and, and, I, and I get that, you know, the, the female form, the, the revealing of aspects of the female form can allude to eroticism, but I think actually it's ownership because, um, you know, the, the breast, for example, throughout European art as well has been this kind of, uh, symbol of fecundity, symbol of, of, of the kind of person who is able to provide. And again, I feel like all these figures are speaking to that. So the eroticism, I'm sure, is there, but that's not my explicit intent. That's not my intent. <laughs> um, did I miss something else that you asked me? No, I'm just curious. Do you think that women might be more different than men? I mean, is there a sort of circumstance? I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure women do. I because I, I think for for women, me being one, so I'll speak for myself. <laughs> like um, to me, it's a sense of empowerment, and and the gaze has always been in the past. The male, most of the female figures that we see. I think the gorilla girls bring this up as well in their work. Is that most of the female figures we see in art, pretty much to present day, is the male gaze. It's this like it's idealized, fetishized gaze of the kind of idealized version of the female form, the woman. Yeah. And when you have women reclaiming that position and saying, I'm going to show you who I am, not, not, your, not someone projecting their idea of who you should be onto you, I think it becomes wholly empowering. Um, and I feel that's what, when I, listen, when I listen to young women speak or, or women speak, I mean, that's usually the feedback I get. I'm not sure about how men feel about it, I think men are less ver verbose than me about how they feel about the work um, in that, from that vein. But I do know for women, I think it can be very, very empowering. Thank you. Do you feel that most of your work has black women as the forefront? And do you feel that you're always having to explain the black body? Like, I know that in work, sometimes when it's black women, it's always, like the question mm -hmm. is eroticized or, um, looked at as a sexual being, so do you feel that you have to always explain that no, this is not about sex or this is about something else? I don't know, I feel like most people are, are, are very, like I said, I give, I give the audience the same, the same kind of respect I would give anyone else in that. I, I, I'm expecting that someone's looking at it from a very kind of, this, with the same energy that I'm giving, right? So, and that is that of respect, of reverence of all of these things. So. Um, no, I don't think that's a constant conversation. A lot of my works are abstract works, and then the works right. I do, with the, there are figurative works. And all the figurative works, to some degree, have a certain amount of nudity in them. Um, if you do a survey of African-American artists or African artists who are women, you will find a very high propensity of women artists using their own bodies in their work. Um, I really would like someone to do a study on why that is, because I do think it's something to do with this idea of empowering yourself, reclaiming that space that has been, you've been told what, it's, what you are for so long, or your image has been projected in a certain way for so long, but you haven't had the autonomy and the control to say, this is actually how I project myself into that space. So, um, no, I don't, I don't really get that question, but although it's, it is an important one, I think, because you know, black figures, black bodies in spaces like this are underrepresented, and we all know the story, we all have spoken about this before, so, um, it is actually important to address that even now because it's only through addressing it that you can have a higher kind of, uh, a more availability for artists like myself to show in spaces like this and have this type of work. So, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not like the first question I get, but it's a, it's a valid one, I think. Do you think, sorry, one more question. Do you think 
that I know um, there are some other artists who have drawn black bodies and then they decide to not do it because of the way that, um, yeah, because of the way that black bodies are looked at. And do you feel that as an artist you should stop creating what you're trying to say because people keep never exactly people yeah. keep misunderstanding what you're trying to say? Because it was one of my favorite artists, and she's like, I'm not drawing the black body anymore. I mean, yeah. the people misunderstanding it means that there's more to be done, right. you know? And, and, and every artist has their own mandate in terms of what their political agenda is or what their narrative or visual agenda is, what they're trying to speak, because essentially why else are you making work and putting it into the public sphere is to have a conversation, usually about void or lack, you know? Um, so, so I think that, that it's, it's the onus, and I, and I hate to use the word of duty and onus, whatever, but I think it's important that if you do receive a lot of backlash by doing what you do, or a lot of like friction or pushback, you do it more. You do it harder, you do it like more in a more kind of bold way, because um, obviously it's a conversation that needs to happen, that people are comfortable having, and that is our job as artists, to have uncomfortable conversations, so. I have used blues before. The color the blue that I've always used in my work is Majorel blue, which is East Klein blue, or it's a it's an ultramarine blue. Is what I've always used up until now. With these works, um, because they're mostly painted, whereas works before literally were you know abstract works where there are blocks of color, I wanted to have gradations in this work. I wanted to have you know that that kind of dimensionality, and so I employed many different blues um, to kind of you know create that those gradients. Um, and blue is, is, is as general as a color, I think, is one of the most spiritual colors, um, transcendent colors. And there are certain hues of blue that I think have far more of that quality than others. Um, but in my use of blue, it's always to try to, to, to get to that, is like, how do you create a, you know, a point where people can, can view it and have a certain kind of frequency and transcend, basically. So that's how I use blues. seen some of your previous work and I know you talk about like what black means to you mm -hmm. the color itself um, about the face the darkened face I've been curious about that yeah um, a young student that was here right before you guys uh, asked me that question and I was laughing with the curator Allison about that before the show because five years I've been practicing and I've been doing the blackened face for about four of them and no one's ever asked me that question. And I find that really, and I, I was a little scared the first time I did it, because I was like, what will be the reaction? And then no one said anything. So I was like, this is odd. Maybe it's just that, that's, uh, you know, um, abrasive that people just kind of just don't want to address it. Um, so onto your, 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 my, your question. You, we know about, you know, in, in the South and African-American history, the use of blackface was used as a way to ridicule um, poke fun at and to kind of diminish black peoples in America. And then also there was a whole other tradition that's far less documented of black performers putting blackface on themselves and projecting that again out to make fun of those who are making fun of them. So it's this kind of very cyclical thing and that's one aspect of it because I do think that's very confining to say that's what it's about. There's also the, because I, I view black in a certain way and I have a reverence for black as a value, as a color. I have a reverence for black as a, as a color and a value, not so much even about conversations that are more culturally significant. Um, and my whole you know, project at the core of it is to, is to renegotiate these ideas around blackness. Um, because if you look at, Better? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like a whole new life out here. Okay, um, so if you look at the, um, if you go into the Webster Dictionary and look up the word black, you'll find the synonyms that are tantamount to sin, dirtiness, 
um, evil, you know, it's all about these kind of negative associations with black. And I was thinking, you know, as a person that would be regarded as black, how would I feel psychologically if this is what I know, are the, are the associations to blackness, and these are the words that are attributed to it. Um, on a psychological standpoint, that is very, uh, like I said, very negative. And these are like the subversive ways that that, that, that we have always been diminished in society, right? Is these kind of ways. And so for me, I wanted to address my, um, you know, the conversation around blackness I'm having is, is how Louise Nevelson speaks about blackness. And she says that black is the most aristocratic color of all. Um, again, this is not to me about a racial thing. It's about having reverence and respect for kind of the materia prima. I look at black as materia prima. Materia, materia prima means, means first matter. If you look into the universe, you look into the sky. If we, when we study this, the universe and the stars, yes, there's daylight, there's the sun, but the cosmos is made mostly of darkness, of black, dark matter. We still don't even know what it consists of, but that's the majority of the universe. And if you, you know, listen to astrophysicists like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan and these people, they will tell you that the idea of the universe is that from nothing was this big bang. Right? And it's from this blackness that, that everything was birthed. So my conversation around blackness is about how do I re replace or reposition the way that we've always negotiated this um, thing that we've been told is the negative is, as a positive is, as a thing of beauty, as a thing to be revered. And so blackening of the face, coming back to that, is, is more of that. It's, I'm a person that's considered to be black, but I'm pretty brown, and you blacken your face, because that to me is a supreme of beauty. Um, so it's kind of having all those conversations at the same time. So for this show, um, obviously I'd come to the space, I saw the space, this kind of beautiful neoclassical, um, you know, uh, architecture, and the works, you know, have that, um, that conversation with the masterworks, right, in terms of the positioning, the figurations, how, how the body is positioned and what the purpose is of uh, doing a portrait in the first place, especially in those eras, like the, por the purpose was to create a, a a figure in a position of power, a legacy, so on and so forth. And I wanted to frame the works in a way that was having conversation with the space as well. And this very, um, you know, this space in particular is a very whitewashed space. I'm not saying that in a negative way. I think it's beautiful. It's very white and just clean. And I wanted the works because they have so much density and so much layers and so much going on. I wanted it to almost be sitting in like a, in a canvas that, that reflects the space as well. Um, also encasing this blackness, the supreme blackness, in the supreme white, you know, white kind of framing, I think adds a certain other conversation or narrative to the works as well. I mean, with my works in general, I'm, I'm not even trying to direct a conversation to a, a group. I mean, I would always say that yes, in the back of my mind, my subconscious, I'm trying to speak to black people. But I'm, it's, not a, it's not this like driving force, I only can, that's my only audience I'm trying to you know, speak to. With these works in particular, it was actually, I think, more important. And that's why I wanted to do it in the South, in the American South, rather than doing it somewhere in South Africa or in the continent somewhere doing it here because of the conversation that's being had. The conversation is actually wholly an African-American story that was transposed to the continent. So this idea that, you know, that most African-Americans feel that they don't have a sense of locality on the continent, they don't know exactly where they come from. So it's this kind of ambiguous, like, you know, plot of land 
and we're African, we know we have that kind of in us, but we don't know where, we don't know how, and that somehow gives us more sense of identity and, and import usually, right? To have a sense of, this is where I'm from. Um, but ironically, Liberia is not that story. Ironically, Liberia is a story where African Americans founded Liberia. And so, it is their land, you know, and it is a place that we can actually say, you know, you have a position here, and historically, you have a position here, even if, your families or none of your people made a migration there. That is some, a place that African Americans have settled and founded in West Africa. And so there is that clear linkage. So I think it's more important for people here to know the story about Liberia than it is for people on the continent the story about Liberia um, because of that, re, um, that kind of the reconnection that happened when people made that move, this back to Africa movement, back to Liberia. Um, I can't really tell you how people read it, those who are of African descent or African versus African American or the diaspora, um, because like I said, it's a general conversation, usually with my work, and this work is more specific, but uh, I, I think that different people, doesn't matter where, have problems with it, different people like it, and I'm kind of neutral either way, because that's not, you know, that's not my, my job per se, but, um, but yeah, I think this, this particular body of work was important to happen in America, in the South. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I uh, was curious, since you studied film, mm -hmm. I was curious if that influenced uh, the framing and the posture of your figures. A um, hundred percent, yes. When I was in school, I went to school for performance and theater in high school, came to the state, Sarah Lawrence, to continue that. Um, kind of found it very confining racially, and so decided, and I've always wanted just autonomy or ability to just do what I want to do, and that's when I went into film. Um, and. I would have still stayed in film, except for the fact that it's such a, a medium that requires so many people to actually make it happen and to um, envision it, and it's a long form process. So this, doing work like this gives me autonomy and, and speed and, and, and um, immediacy that making films will not, although I would love to revisit film again in the future. Film, um, I was looking at offshore film directors, I was studying you know, art history, I was writing about um, you know, Godard and Sam Ben and all of these, you know, Wong Kar Wai, one of my favorite, favorite filmmakers. I think he's why I started even making films in the first place. Um, and the fathers and the, you know, the forefathers and the auteurs of film. And so 100%, I, I don't, I can't tell you like literally how it works, but I know that I see things very filmically. Um, I see things in, in sets and stages and in, in, in uh, layers and pers perspectives. A lot of the time, even the works that don't look that they have that, that's how I'm kind of, that the schematic in my head is based on like this much more holistic viewpoint of something rather than a piece, a piece here, a piece here, which is how you have to look at things with film because it's a whole world you're creating. Um, and the way I even speak about my practice, the way I, I put myself into the world, the way that I share the work I do, is about this whole inclusivity and this whole kind of create a whole, creating a whole world around myself and allowing people to come into that world. So yeah, 100% film is very much still and, you know, a part of a big, a big influence in the work I do. Yes? I'm interested in your practice, uh, particularly with these works and Wanting to know, did you put one at a time? Did you have several going at once? Oh, yeah. How did how how did you manage that? Um, they were all going at once for the most part. I started, like I said, I did. I started this series before I was, um, I was approached by Noma, so there were four works already in you know production that I'd actually put aside for a good year because I hadn't reconciled it yet. Um, and then re re kind of initiating the, the project again, I kind of work in stages where I do the photography, so all of these works, all the figures are photographs, like I said, and um, they're all myself, they're not self-portraits, but they're myself, and so that is a certain amount of staging that goes into that, get all, getting all the fabrics and um, sourcing, and then I had someone come and do the hair, and so all of these things were steps and stages, and, and even just doing the research before that to figure out how those would even work together, um, that was photographed, and then comes like the post-production, the editing of that photograph, and also laying out the compositions of the works. All the works are pre-composed before they're on, before uh, before they're printed on paper, um, and then the printing, and then the working. So all that happened pretty much um, after the first four. At the same time, the works just kind of on rotation in the studio, because also the way the production works is there's a lot of wait time in between things. So 
you know, priming, gilding, all that stuff. So it requires, I can't just work on one at a time. I need to keep it, keep it moving. Yes. Um, you spoke a bit about how like the neoclassical architecture of like this, the Grand Hall influenced the hanging and design of the work. But I was wondering uh, to what degree, if at all, a dialogue with the um, uh, classicizing European artwork in the surrounding galleries came into uh, your practice in creating it. Because I mean, it's, it's something you see every, everywhere, you know, so it's in your subconscious regardless. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a student of art in the more like uh, classical sense, but I go to museums and I see works and I, you know, I inform and I educate myself about the history of art. So, of course, there was a certain period in European in European art where the figure was the most important thing, you know, the most important aspect. And those are the works we're seeing all in the other kind of galleries around. And then you have as well the upcoming Duke of Orleans collection coming. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date, but I know Alison can tell you. Um, and I knew that what kind of works would be in, those, in that collection too. So that's actually what spurred me to do a, a body of work about figuration rather than abstract works, was to have a conversation with, and see where it fit and where it didn't fit with all these classical kind of, you know, portrait and figurative works that were in the museum and will be in the museum shortly. Oh. Yeah, um, the first four uh, works, which I'm sure I could point out to you, but um, you probably will be able to tell without me saying to you, that all the works of the blue hair. Um, I wasn't really trying to adopt a you know particular uh, kind of or reference a particular type of you know hairstyle, but as the series unfolded, as of last year and this year, I was definitely referencing um, more traditional ha hairstyles that are found in West in West Africa. So I worked with a hair with a hairstylist, and we, we basically created these these these, hair, these hairstyles basically to speak to to further kind of have this conversation around ideas, you know, narratives around blackness, around you know, African hair, African West African hairstyles. When you talk about tribal hairstyles or or, or, or hairstyles that are, that belong to certain regions, um, historically. Uh, there's a reason why they, they adopt those kind of hairstyles. There's a reason why, um, you know, Himba women uh, wear red clay and have their hair, you know, all, all, all wrapped and dreaded. There's a reason why all these things happen. So I was trying to allude to certain things. And then the, obviously the one that actually was the most um, localized here was just the Afro in that one, like where it's just literally an Afro. But all the rest of them are very much coiffed in a very kind of sculptural hairstyles because that's what you find. Um, in terms of more traditional cultures. I think we're good. Oh, what, what was your uh, you know, reference when you changed from photographic paper and photographic imagery to the canvas? The canvas? Um, so it was about, because like I said, this is a, it was a site-specific exhibition, so um, I already discussed with the curator, Allison, about filling up every single space here um, and having a mother work. So even though you can't really tell um, because the framing is so, you know, it's, it's dense, yeah. the paperwork's are significantly smaller than the canvas work, but then once the framing's on it, it didn't really, you can't really tell in terms of the ratio, but that was meant to be the kind of centerpiece to kind of, you know, um, lock in the rest of the works around it. Thank you very much, everyone. I've had a great time being here and talking. And, uh, <laughs>